you. <laughs> Thank you. I wish you could just bring the energy, guys. My goodness. Wow. I really like these guys up here. That's going to be fun. <laughs> Well, we are obviously um, uh, thrilled about the announcement of Dr. Hammond and uh, excited about the opportunity for them to take the leadership of Gordon, but I am sad to not be able to be his colleague here at Taylor, and we will find ways to keep him uh, connected to the institution. Rebecca and I are so excited uh, to be coming here this summer, and thank you so much for the amazing welcome. This morning, I want to talk to you, <laughs> this morning I want to talk to you about the two tracks of our life and how we think about opportunities that come our way. No doubt, the most beloved hymn of all time is Amazing Grace, penned in 1792 by John Newton, who was the master of a slave ship who became an Anglican priest. Although Amazing Grace is his most recognized hymn, he actually wrote 300 different songs over the course of his life. And eventually he went to go work with William Wilberforce to help end the British slave trade in the 19th century. A number of historians have noted how his simple and yet profound lyrics speak to a heart that's been transformed. As he himself writes, I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The message of the hymn is a message of redemption, but also of great hope. The Lord hath promised good to me, his word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as life, as long as life endures. Several years ago, a wonderful Christian filmmaker named Michael Flaherty and his firm Walden Media produced a major motion picture on the life of William Wilberforce, and they chose the title of the movie to be Amazing Grace. For that, they invited the singer-songwriter Chris Tomlin to add a bridge to the iconic hymn. Tomlin added in the following, My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The last six months have been a strange mix of emotions for my family and me. We reached the conclusion that God was calling us uh, to step away from my role at Gordon College, and Gordon has been a very important part in our life. Our uh, twin daughters, Caroline and Emily, learned to ride their bikes on the sidewalks around the quad at Gordon. Our oldest daughter, Elizabeth, there's a particular, particular bench swing right outside the library that's her favorite spot, which she loves. But I have to say, the amazing kindness and hospitality that you guys have shown to us has just really overwhelmed us. From the warm welcome we get to the encouraging emails that have been sent, I have to give a shout out to Tessa D'Souza and the SEND group because they have sent care packages to our oldest daughter, Elizabeth, which have just melted our heart. We have fallen in love with this place and cannot wait to be here this summer. Of course, I have to say, you know, there's so many things that we're looking forward to being here. We're looking forward to Silent Night, to Air Band, but probably most important, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but Taylor, like Gordon, it's not a perfect place. There are many challenges along the way, and we'll have more to face in the days ahead. But I take courage from the admonition we get here in the passage that we read from 1 Peter. Eugene Peterson's translation, known as The Message, sums it up well. If with heart and soul, he writes, you're doing good, do you think you can be stopped? Even if you suffer for it, you're still better off. Don't give the opposition a second thought. Through thick and thin, keep your hearts at attention in adoration before Christ, your master. Keep your hearts at attention, he says. Other translations take that particular phrase as, in your hearts, set apart Christ. The book of 1 Peter was actually written for Christians living in the crucible. We know a little bit about the story out of which it came. It was written, of course, by that passionate, mercurial disciple of Jesus known as Peter. 
He was one who would go out and literally walk on water toward Jesus. But then at a moment when it really counted, he denied him three times. We see in chapter one of this epistle that Peter wrote it to a group of people who were, quote, grieved by various trials, he says. He reminds them of the hope that we have in Christ and emphasizes how that hope grounded in the reality of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ can give us the confidence to face whatever it is we face today. Because truly, friends, we serve a Savior who has conquered death itself. We can cast all our cares on God, we're told in chapter 5 of this epistle, because he cares for us. And even though this book also reminds us that there is an enemy who is prowling about like a roaring lion who seeks to devour us, we should not be afraid because it is God who gets the last word. We believe that Peter wrote this particular epistle in Rome somewhere between 60 and 64 AD when the persecution of Christians was really on the rise in the Roman Empire. But even in that environment, Peter tells us we should not retaliate when people do bad things to us or when we have trials or tribulations. In verse 9, he says, do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Why are we to repay evil with blessing? I think it is because the fundamental reality of the Christian life is that we have been blessed in order to be a blessing to others. We are blessed to be a blessing. The way of Jesus is very much countercultural. If we if think about the way that Jesus related to the authorities and the rulers of his day, he was never intimidated by them, never really impressed by them, and at the same time, he didn't repudiate them. Why is that? And I think part of it is that Jesus understood that in that cultural moment, there was an important way in which we would bear witness to our faith. He phrased it as, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. The model of Christ is one of patience and forbearance under suffering. He was, after all, the suffering servant that was foretold in the book of Isaiah. Gentleness, meekness, and humility, we are taught, is how we should be known. Now, sadly, I don't think a lot of Americans think of those attributes when they think of the Christian community. If I'm being honest, probably most people don't think of that when they look at me. And yet, that is what we are called to do embody. That's the kind of virtue we are called to live out. Part of what we have to do is to ask the Lord, how can we in our everyday life follow in the footsteps of Jesus? Every so often for the last hundred or so years, there's been a cultural phenomenon that rises up in the church. In our lifetime, it came in the form of a little bracelet or an acronym of WWJD, which stood for What Would Jesus Do? But it really started back in the late 19th century when a guy named Charles Sheldon wrote a little book entitled In His Steps with the subtitle, What Would Jesus Do? Sheldon took actually a passage from the book of 1 Peter to inform how he would write this book. It became a best-selling book. There were over 50 million copies of this book have been sold. The main character in the book is the Reverend Henry Maxwell. One day he challenges his fictional congregation not to do a single thing for an entire year without first asking, what would Jesus do? The book relates the stories of different members of his congregation and how they responded to that calling they should put on their life. One guy, for example, decided that he was going to leave his job after discovering that his company had been committing major fraud. Another decides to help convert a seedy part of town with some real estate development and in the process changes the feel of the place for good. You see, the call to righteous living is as old as the Bible, but so are the challenges and the temptations to fall away. I used to believe that life was sort of a, a series of chapters that we lived, and, and one chapter would be about joy and enthusiasm and excitement, and maybe there'd be another chapter that would be about difficulty or challenge or sadness. 
I suppose I, I bought into this American dream-like version of the gospel that said, you know, everything was getting better on a consistent sort of pathway that was going to eventually get us into a much better place. But I have to say, after living life for 49 years and being on a college campus for a number of those, I've come to the conclusion that the way of Jesus entails a lot more suffering than I care to admit. I've always been a glass half full kind of person. I love the book of Philippians, which is the book of joy in the New Testament because it's a positive, uplifting message. I love the stories of Joseph and Nehemiah in the Old Testament because in the end, they are folks who, who triumph and they make the world a much better place because of their godly leadership. But every year during Holy Week, we are reminded that even Jesus' most triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, it did not occur on a chariot or a steed, but instead on a lowly donkey. Jesus was not tried before the authorities in a way that was good or right or fitting. Instead, it was under the cover of night, orchestrated through a shady deal in which one of his disciples betrayed him for just 30 pieces of silver. Every year on April 9th, I have a pit in my stomach because it's the anniversary of the execution of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the evangelical pastor who was hung by the Nazis for his treason against Hitler in World War II. It breaks my heart that Bonhoeffer was executed quite literally days before his POW camp was freed by American soldiers. Why did God allow that to happen? It makes no sense in the spiritual economy that I would devise. I mean, here is a man who produced such amazing theological works like Life Together and the Cost of Discipleship. If he could have just lived for a few more days, he was going to be freed. And then imagine what he could have done to serve the global church in the decades following World War II. But in the upside down world of God's economy, that's actually not what happened. The Christian journey, you see, like Bonhoeffer's untimely death, does not always make sense from a human perspective. Ours is a God who uses the foolish to teach the wise, the mute to bear witness, the poor who become rich in God's kingdom. When I was here last month and shared a little bit about my, our calling to Taylor, I told you about some of the journey and the sleepless night that we experienced. I still can't believe that the Lord has led us, and we're so excited to be able to be here. But I wanted to be able to share with you a little bit more of a fuller story of my life in recent months. It's one that I think aligns with the message of 1 Peter. I mentioned that I had spent most of the Christian life assuming that we sort of go through life where you have seasons of blessing and then maybe seasons of burden. But it turns out that's not the way that life works. The Christian life is really about going down two parallel tracks at the same time. We experience the two tracks of blessing and burden, not as separate chapters or seasons, but oftentimes at the very same moment. I first encountered this idea from the pastor uh, Rick Warren in California. Rick is an extraordinary man who made publishing history when he published the book, The Purpose Driven Life. It sold more copies than any other book except the Bible in human history. Just an extraordinary run and it reached millions and millions and millions of people. You would think that Rick would be on top of the world in that very season. But actually, if you knew his story, you knew that his wife was battling cancer and his son was struggling very deeply with depression. At the very moment when Rick should be celebrating and toasting all the good things that have happened, he was actually grieving the possibility of losing his wife or maybe even his son. The day before, my final interview for the presidency at Taylor University, which took place last month, a tragedy of unspeakable death came to my family. Some of you may have heard the story that 10 years ago, 
as part of my own calling to Gordon, we had a family tragedy. I have a younger cousin named Trent. He was killed in a car accident. I'm an only child, so my cousins have always been like brothers and sisters to me. Losing him was a very, very difficult thing for us. He died at age 32, leaving behind a wife and three young kids. But it was his death that impressed upon me, we are not promised tomorrow. And I had been approached about the opportunity to at least apply for the job at Gordon. And I thought, you know, maybe in a few years, but not right now. But after losing Trent, I just became convinced, you know what, maybe this is exactly what I should do. So I threw my hat in the ring, never expecting it would work out, but in God's providence, it did. It was an important lesson I learned about not letting opportunities to pass us by. Given the role that Trent's death played in my calling to Gordon, it would be unthinkable that another family tragedy might be part of my journey to my next place of service at Taylor. But for some reason, that is what occurred. The day before my final interview last month, his older sister, my cousin Kelly, was killed in a similarly freakish automobile accident. Like her brother, she was killed not for anything that she did wrong. Her vehicle just happened to be in the wrong place at exactly the wrong moment. And in that hinge moment at age 49, she was struck down in the prime of her life. That occurred seven weeks ago on Monday. Now, my Aunt Kay and Uncle Ron have lost both of their children. And just as I do not understand why Bonhoeffer was taken just days before he was set to be freed, so also I do not understand why God would take my two cousins in such a senseless series of accidents that has left a painful scar for us. I share that because you might look at my life and think that everything is all happy and rosy and that things are all going great, much as I might assume the very same thing about you. But I do not know the burden you might be carrying today, just as you might not know that burden in my life. But sometimes scripture tells us even the burden can be a source of blessing because we serve a God who does redeem even the deepest, darkest parts of our life. I wish I could say that I have it all figured out, but if I'm being very honest with you, (laughs) it's tough to even speak. This is really difficult. As excited as I am about coming to Taylor, there are parts of my life that are very sad. And yet we're admonished in this passage not to worry or to be afraid, but to set our hearts on Christ, because through this we are brought closer to God. We're called to bear witness to our faith, to be ready to give an account for anyone who asks, what is the reason you have a hope within you? As I thought about what I might share in this, my very first time to speak in the Taylor Chapel, I asked the Lord to give me an image or a parable. Sometimes the Lord can use the simplest things of life to make the most profound messages real. We're just getting to know one another, but you'll soon learn that I don't often speak about the journey Rebecca and I have had of parenting our oldest daughter, Elizabeth. You may know she has severe special needs due to a very rare genetic disorder. She looks typical, but if you interact with her for just a few seconds, you will quickly know that she is very special. There's no known cure for Elizabeth, and short of a miracle of God, Elizabeth will likely never speak or be independent like you and me. But like every teenager, Elizabeth absolutely has preferences, and she can make her desires known. As Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Faith in Christ is important to all of us, but in Elizabeth's case, she really doesn't have the means to communicate it as often as you or as I. Elizabeth attends a wonderful special needs school that's close to the Gordon campus called the Children's Center for Communication. 
It's not a faith-based school, and like most places, it's filled with people of different faiths or of no faith at all. But something special can happen when we are ready to give an account for the hope that we have within us. For her, it occurs in the way in which she shares the amazing grace of Jesus Christ with her classmates and teachers through a music video of her very favorite a cappella group called Noteworthy. I have a short little video. Let's watch. What's great about Elizabeth is she's funny, she's smart. It's cool to see her when she uses her AAC device because she can really express the things that are important to her. Um, her faith, she expresses her faith a lot through her music and through the choices that she makes and that her family is important to her. So when Elizabeth listens to her preferred songs, there's a couple different things that you can see change in her. She becomes calmer and more focused, but she also becomes happier. So the way that we teach Elizabeth is we break tasks down into very small steps, and we teach those steps, and then she receives tokens or reinforcement for when she completes those steps as asked. Her favorite by far is to choose to listen to music. She typically will choose her church songs and Amazing Grace is a long time favorite. Usually that they, they have learned to love her music too. That they're um, saying that they like it or they think it's great. Or we have a student who liked to comment, peachy keen jelly bean. <laughs> And I think she, we're just really lucky to have her on the earth. It's just amazing to get to learn from her, too. So what about Amazing Grace? Do you want more or not? More. Do you want more Amazing Grace? <laughs>
told not to be afraid when we encounter the burdens and the challenges, but instead to bear witness. If a sweet little child who has no real words to speak can point others to the amazing grace we have come to find in the person of Jesus Christ, how much more so ought we to be prepared to be willing to give an answer to everyone who asks for the hope that we have within us? This was true for the slave trader turned Anglican priest, John Newton. It was true for the author, Charles Sheldon. True for Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's true for Elizabeth. It's true for you and for me. May we be a community traveling down together the two tracks that bear witness to Jesus Christ with both the burdens and the blessings that God will use in our lives to draw us ever closer to him. Let's pray. We acknowledge in a room this large, Lord, that there are people who are carrying very heavy burdens. And I ask that you will use the grace and the compassion and the love of this community to minister to those people in extraordinary ways in the minutes, days, and weeks ahead. May we be a community that binds up the broken hardened and cares for them as you care for us. May we also, Father, recognize that you bring so many good gifts from above that come into our life as great blessings. And while we would prefer sometimes to have a lot more of the blessings and a lot fewer of the burdens, we acknowledge that you are sovereign and in control, and we are going to yield our life to your lordship. May we, O oh God, be different people. We ask now that you would take our minds and think through them. Would you take our words and speak through them? Would you take our hands and our feet and work through them? And would you take our hearts and set them afire? that we might be changed people having encountered your word for us today. This we pray in the strong name of Christ our Savior. Amen. God bless you. Go with God.